Washington, where they could protect them. <laughs> they were playing defense, but when they went out abroad in the land, people protested. The story that we were doing turned protest at a rally for a uh, anti communist black McCarthy. So now Further ado, I will let you tell your story and I will interrupt your life. And, and Alex is here. <laughs> okay, take it away. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you here. Yeah. Come on, Thank you very much. I'm going to start by saying I was not a victim. At age eight, at age eight, I had the privilege of having this hero of a father, and that's the way my brother and I were um, presented with what was happening to, to our family, and that it was something that we were uh, tremendously proud of my father for standing up to the bad guys. And I will say that my my father was on the House Art and Activities Committee in 1964, which was a period then, I guess your, your show is. So it was already a period when the civil rights movement was going strong and the world was um, building up. So the sense of the speech movement was already on at birth. So this was a huge movement that was very outspoken that I think gave us the, the um, kind of support system in a way that um, I probably benefited from, um, as opposed to someone who lived in 1953 when the Rosenbergs were executed for being um, communist. So I recognize there's that difference. Um, but um, anyway, I'll tell you what happened and some of the details, and can uh, feel free to ask me any questions. So, um, yes, I was eight. My family was living in Buffalo, New York, and the reason my parents had moved up to Buffalo was because my father was indeed a communist. He was a member of the Communist Party. He grew up in the Bronx, um, born in Brownsville, and grew up in the Bronx, a very working class family. Um, my grandparents were immigrants from Poland and Russia. My grandfather was a garment worker. And so my father grew up in a very working class household during the Depression. And he was influenced by the conditions of their lives and the movements that were taking place in the 1930s, which were as vibrant as um, the 1960s. And so he was radicalized um, during the time when there were union drives and people were fighting evictions in the Bronx you know, during the Depression. And then he fought in World War II, um, a year in the, um, in the army. And so he he uh, fought against fascism in, in World War II. So he was very politicized, and he very much believed in egalitarian society, where people were not divided by any or religion. And that's what he believed in. And so he joined the movement that represented that. And and who approached him and brought him into the Communist Party? How was he? Was he, 
well, he told the story that he grew up um, on in, on Tremont Avenue and, and Prospect. I don't know if anyone knows the Bronx, but um, so he said growing up in the third, there would be on each of the four corners, there would be someone on a soapbox. And on one corner would be a sort of a communist party, another corner would be an anarchist, and another corner would be a Trump, kind of left second queens, and the fourth corner would be someone else. So it was just it was the air that people were, you know, talking about um, um, about a better life for working people. So he found that. And then he went on to fight in World War II. When he came back, he was working in the garment industry and an activist um, had friends who were in the Communist Party. And she introduced them, and then they actually invited him to a meeting, I guess. And then he was at uh, NYU as a, grad, as a student. He went to school on the GI Bill. Pay for your education after he came. Story. Yeah, he wanted to be a writer. He was at NYU, and at that time, in the late 40s, there was actually a huge student movement at, at NYU and other colleges. And a lot of them were, a lot of the people who came out of World War II were, were radicalized by their experience of being in the war and knowing that they had been fighting against Hitler and, and fascism. So he was exposed in that way, too. He was kind of in the air. Um, I think my mother, who was an artist, and she um, was in the village. Um, uh, she went to music high school and then left home and moved to the Lower East Side to a walk, mm -hmm. a real walk, no bathroom, you know, <laughs> <laughs> got ringworm. And, uh, <laughs> so she was studying with artists, and then um, there was a famous bookstore in the village. And it was a place where all these uh, artists and poets would go through. And, and she would have been with us. And my father was out there. Also, that's what they met. Very romantic. Village. Village. Um, village. Love story. <laughs> anyway, they were there. And then, um, you know, work he was involved in. Oh, uh, he, he did something that was really, that I'm so, like, Y'all heard of Paul Robeson? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No? Remember yes, I yeah. um, Who was very much also attacked by um, uh, for being a communist. So, I don't think he was a member of the communist party, but he was definitely a supporter. And, you know, he just, he was this. A lot of times when they talk about Paul Robeson, they say he was a great athlete and, you know, actor, blah, blah. Which, yes, he was. But he was, you know, he was a communist. He he was a in spirit and beliefs and morals and going around singing um, songs and all kinds of languages that had to do with working people. And he was very much attacked and lost his passport and lost his his you know his livelihood. And he was someone who was making a lot of money in the twenties and very a lot a lot of money uh, as, a, as a performer. Uh, but anyway, so there was a famous case in East Hill, New York, where Paul Robeson went to in a concert. It was an outdoor concert. And um, this group of racists came and threw, well, he wasn't able, even able to sing at that first concert. It was attacked violently by people with um, rocks. And earth. look, if you Google Peak Skill and Paul Robeson, you'll see these pictures of um, uh, car windows being smashed, very, very violent. And so then they had a second concert that they called people to be um, security force. And this was an outdoor concert I hear. So I was one of those, those people um, that they, there was a ring of a thousand people around the whole uh, concert area to protect all of them and, and um, allow the concert to go on. And uh, keep it that. So that is, that is uh, something that's part of um, his experience. So then he, he moved to Buffalo, New York, um, and to work in 
factories to organize in the union, and um, they were at this point what was considered um, secret or non-public members of the Communist Party. And this was in 1953, so this was right when the Rosenbergs were accused of um, inside the Soviet Union and were executed, and there were rallies and big lines against their, um, you know, against them being executed. They participated in all of that. And then they went up to Buffalo, which was a very industrial um, city with lots of factories. And this was something that the um, Communist Party was doing throughout the, like, the Midwest. People would um, move to Cleveland or Cincinnati or Detroit, and, like, beef up um, um, the boy. Were recruited by the party, the Communist Party, sent to Buffalo? Yeah, and they're asked if they like to go. Organized. Yeah. Specifically, to move to Buffalo and, and get factories and and the organizers in the union, and but this was not um, they were they were not um, they weren't the same work members. Whereas when my father went to join that, that ring of people around Paul Rose, he was um, a member of the Communist Party, but because of this. Um, the period you're talking about, you're studying and you're writing about because of this anti communist period. And in 1954, the Communist Party was made illegal. It was illegal to be a member of the Communist Party. So, in order to continue uh, organizing, they were not. So, there was a, a, a public presence. The movement was um, implemented. And they were still union activists, and they were against racism and against you know, abuse of the factories. And, um, but they wouldn't say they were the So those were the reasons, those were the conditions that, that my mother and father moved up to Buffalo, and that's where my brother and I were born. So he worked in factories for about nine years, and they kept finding out, you know, that he was. I didn't know he was a communist or not, I knew he was a, a, an activist of some sort, so they fired him. So after all, he couldn't get any work in the factories anymore. And so he went back to graduate school. So he was in uh, the University of Buffalo as a graduate student, and he, he was getting his uh, dissertation in English literature. I said he called him to be a writer. You know? um, so it was at that point in 1964 that came to Buffalo and did a round of subpoenas. And so he was there, um, there were um, 16 people called, subpoenaed to appear before QAC. One of them was an FBI agent who had infiltrated the Communist Party and he had um, spying on my father and his cohort, his comrades, for 20 years. Oh, my father had been there for 20 years, but he, this man, professed in the in the uh, old FBI and in the Communist Party. So he was their witness to abuse of others. They called the other 15 for um, not so the, one of the main um, first one they called was my father. And what they were concerned about, and as I was telling Norman. Um, after the whole thing about QAC, you know, is, is, is to intimidate and to scare people and to get um, people's employers to uh, fight them, to get people's friends to uh, disown them, to just have people be harassed. So that it wasn't illegal if you weren't on trial for anything. So the whole thing about it was an intimidation fact. So that that really worked for a long time, and people were having careers damaged, like you know, with Hollywood Ten, and and who were probably the more privileged group because many of them were maybe lost, you know, Hollywood, but maybe they could go and work with them. Um, um, you know, anonymously and still right. But then figuring people who were in factories were uh, attacked by, by these type of committees were in a much less um, privileged situation, I would say. But anyway, there was a lot of fear. Um, and the standard 
procedure through the, um, and the UX committee is preceded by other committees that started in, in 1990, really. The UX started in 1938, and, um, and so the whole McCarthy period, Joseph McCarthy, was a very small time period of this repression, suppression of people throughout the century, even after the um, Even after HUAC was done and continued as a well, the program, which was the FBI program to um, destroy the Black Panther Party. So that went on into the 70s and 80s. Now we have Donald Trump. But, um, so anyway, what they're concerned about, so, so the intimidation is going on, you know, people were very fearful, and the standard procedure was for people who were called for the UX to claim amendment when they were enrolled in this committee, and, um, and so that, that kind of intimidation continued. But then at a certain point, people began to really, in, in different ways, refuse to answer belligerent and really confront the, the, the HUAC committee members more and more. And that's what happened in, in 1960, and then in 1964 with my father's case, and in 1967, people stood up even more. And then once that started happening, we couldn't do what we're trying to do because of the intonation. But I'm getting the... Who cared the HUAC? Um, investigation and, and uh, what was accomplished? The chair, so these were congressional committees. So the chair was Edwin Willis. He was from Louisiana. He was chair. And then there was William Buck, who was from Virginia. There was also a fool from Texas. There was Richard Eckford from Missouri. There was a guy from Arizona, um, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin. Nobody from the East. No, a lot of them. That's what I'm going to um, tell you about in a minute. But so, what the uh, path is around this is two sheet. Um, this, this was uh, the document that the um, the committee released was the chairman's opening statement in 1964, and it says what they were looking for when they came to Buffalo. So, what happened was there were were concerned that there were two new radical communist groups sprouting up in Buffalo. And one of those groups had, in fact, just taken a group of young people to Cuba, which the United States was to um, do new society in Cuba. So they were concerned about that. That's why they came to Buffalo. So, so um, they, uh, this is the, and Buffalo, my mother is like to me, Buffalo is a very conservative town. And there are many Jews. There wasn't a large Jewish community in Buffalo. And my parents were Jewish, so it was like um, a double kind of way to intimidate. Uh, and I said, once you um, get your community to be against you, so they were kind of The UAC committee was hoping that being a conservative city um, with a conservative newspaper, this stereotype of communist being Jews, you know, completing that. Um, that was part of the process. So here's the, so he was called, my father was subpoenaed, and so there's a, there was two newspapers. One was the Buffalo Evening News, which apparently was a more conservative one, and then there was the Buffalo Freer Express or something like that. So you can see it says red colonizers here named by FBI. This is kind of headlines that the committee was relying on the community being um, uh, um, up against these people. So, um, so this former undercover agent tells about common meetings, identifies member of the at UB, the University of Buffalo, and a party organizer center from New York. And the subheadline: How Committee on Un-American Activities called Paul Sporn, a UB faculty member, as a second witness. Um, and then the first one being this this FBI agent. I want to point out to you in the like the fourth paragraph. It says 
Paul Scorn of 442 and ancient chapter among 16 persons who have been subpoenaed to testify at the hearing. So I mean our street address was the front page of the newspaper that was all over the um the city. So just in terms of you know safety of family that you know realize what um you know, it's like Donald Trump say he doesn't he didn't hit someone. He didn't send anyone to hit someone at a rally, but the kind of talk, the way he talks can then keep up and so people saying go out and hurt someone, but you put the address, you know, in a very, you know, so that's that. That's the Then, it's like another one. <laughs> Uh, the chairman says the hearing is justified. Facts developed reveal red crop in the U.S. 15 witnesses heard, most of them invoking the fifth and other amendments. And so that fifth amendment is important. Um, they want the people, they want the people to claim the fifth. What do you know about the fifth <laughs> amendment? <laughs> so it's commonly thought that if you if you claim the fifth that you have something to hide, that you're guilty of something that you're trying to hide. Which in fact that's not uh, that's really not the essence of the fifth amendment. The fifth amendment was designed to protect innocent people. But it was it became this um, idea that if you go up, if you cut the fifth, of course you were just trying to hide something that, that you did. So in and, and so my father had a very I know you have a lawyer in your in your piece. Is that a character? So um, to me, my father was a great character. He had this lawyer who was also a, a, a Fabulous, um, brilliant man who had many, many years defending immigrants going back to the like the 30s, and there even wasn't a, a field of immigration law. But he was defending immigrants, and then he started defending people who were called before House on American Activities Committee. And I was trying to figure out why was it connected. I was in how did an immigration lawyer get involved in the battles who were being surveilled and then called before these committees. And the connection is that our history rebels and immigrants have always been um, kind of connected. The idea in the 30s and 40s that these immigrants are bringing in these radical ideas. So coming to today, the idea that all Muslims are bringing in a dangerous ideology, so we need to, you know, surveil and suppress Muslims. So it's a similar thing. This lawyer whose name was um, Ira Gallivan uh, had been um, not because it was a, a, a trial, but represents people who were from the U.S. for many years, some famous cases actually. And um, he felt that the claim of the fifth might protect the individuals, but it was really being defeated politically by the committee. So he was like searching for a way to, to approach this in a different way. And so he felt that if it tried to claim every other amendment that you possibly could and only claim the fifth as a last resort, because what you could be charged with was contempt of court. So if you didn't, if you refused to answer, you could be a, a charged with contempt of court, and then you had a legal, you know. So um, the approach that he took with my father and the, and the group of witnesses was to only in the last resort claim fifth, but also challenge the, legit the legitimacy of the committee every step of the way. And so that's what what he did. And so here are some of the um, exchanges between, this is my father here. There are the exchanges between 
uh, my father and the committee. So uh, one of the first things before, and they called it, they called it hearing to order, and then they have the guy agent in um, because I'm on the information about all these communists. And then they called my father. So the first thing my father would come with a tape recorder. And he was looking for a plug it in. And as my mother says, even the, the court really a surprise. So the court officer there, my father looked for a place to pull this. Um, he was like, what's going on? And they started gabbling and banging the gavel. Like, you can't do it. What are you doing? And my father said, well, I know that these, you, know, you rely on these papers to. Um, Board on this, and I get home. I find sure that you know the truth is, but it was all just a way to to, to challenge So they said, no, you can't have it. So they took the paper away, right? and then they um, swore him in. He said, well, "Before I sworn in, I want to make a statement." They said, "No, you have to be sworn, and then you can make a statement." He said, "No." If you let me make the statement, you want me to swear me in. This whole thing will be, you know, um, relevant. So I went back and forth like this, back and forth, back and forth. Before you know, they they um, said, you can make a statement here. They want to make a statement. And the statement was all about how, well, here's the thing about him. Um, his statement was about how the committee was illegitimate. That it was on a number of grounds, it was legit. And that um, the main reason he cited this is the whole, this is the um <clears throat> this is the text, the transcript of the whole hearing, which reads crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, one of the things the points he made was that these committee members were sitting in Congress illegally because most of the Many of the states didn't allow black people to vote. They were illegitimate. They were not elected um, uh, legitimately. That they were not, that they were sitting illegally in Congress, so they had no right to hold this to committee and to sit there. So the way of, again, but um, so actually, here's a picture of um, students protesting on the campus were. Um, so it wasn't just like my father was this super fan who went. There was a, a, a movement behind him, and you can see some of the students who marched to pick it up outside the courthouse. There were uh, petition campaigns. Um, there's a Joan Baez, the, the um, uh, folk singer, she came and sang at the at the rallies. So it was it was um, reaching out in the community for support. And uh, so, was she still employed at the university? At this point, at this point, this was April of 1964. So then, the Courier Buffalo Courier Express. So, so here's what my father's lawyer said was uh, the clincher that this was this this was um, the company's purposes, and that the headline says, "You the instructor ridicules sweat." So rather than someone running away with their tail between the legs. Right on the, the headline, um, to the instructor refused refuse to answer query on the link communist party. Um, and the second paragraph yes, page mm -hmm. of the newspaper. And I was in, and one thing my parents did, um, I was in, I was in second grade, my brother was in. So, um, as soon as they got the subpoena from HUAC, they went to our school and said, this is happening, and we want you to make sure that our children are protected. 
So I had to put the notice. And if they were, you know, they were protecting us, but they were also making a statement to the school community that that this is wrong and we're you know, we should be correct anyway. So um, bring back to uh, the readers. Uh, Sterling Hayden, who was one of the number 10, came and spoke in defense there, he came up to Buffalo, and he said, QAP almost ruined Hollywood. So he, you know, came and, and um, that helped bring more uh, national. Everybody know who Sterling Hayden was? He was a strange folk. He was, he was uh, Jack D. Ripper. Who were two that they were floored in the war. He's a great, great actor. Or by himself. Here's another um, um, paper of the different protests. And there's also a flyer that they did a post press attack on the rights and this the members. Um, members of the committee and how they voted on the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and showing that like, them had voted no on the Civil Rights Act. Um, so this was in the New York Times. Buffalo University first teacher who walked red and toward. So the result was that my father was fired from the University of Buffalo after this act. And the reason he was fired was to hear more, um, more protest kind of things that they put So they weren't. The U.S. wasn't um, successful in um, this my father was one fifteen, like I said. So almost all the rest of the fifteen approached the committee in the same way. So it wasn't just kind of like one after another they were like going on and on. And some of it's where's um so it's quite funny. you can you can even I don't have to read for but um, you can around. Um, some of the exchanges were that um, they were asking him questions about um was we went to graduate cum laude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you the most born that graduated from um, NYU? And, and so he said, oh, you're asking me to, to betray one of my principles of bragging about myself. And you know, <laughs> they were trying to get why someone who graduated from life that was working in a factory and was not more suspicious about that. You know? I was like, well, is it something not honorable about working in a factory? He would pro that. Another one they said, do you keep a high school uh, diploma after they asked for graduate from college? And he said, well, in New York State, you have to have a, uh, a diploma to go to college. So it's like all these things back and forth. So the thing was, the reason he was, they were able to fire him was because of something called the Feinberg Law, which was the loyalty oath. And um, so I work for, for New York State, which is really Buffalo, is part of the University of New York. So there's you had signed um, a oath that you were not and never that you were at the time. So my father signed the oath because he needed a job, and so he signed it. But it was not a it was a uh, uh, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, that was the reason that they could fire him because he had signed something to this committee. 
you know, identified as having been in the Communist Party. That um, law was eventually returned by the Supreme Court. But um, not time for my father to not be um, fired. So he was out of work that year. Remember, we, we left Buffalo and moved to Detroit when I was nine. So that year he was unemployed and he was trying to finish writing his dissertation, being fired. And at the same time, his name was in the paper. And um, he was a friend on the train today, and he in his last row was writing his dissertation. <laughs> I said, well, at least you're not. <laughs> So I remember my father going up. We lived in a, we rented a house. We rented like a two, uh, the upper, upper part of a two family house. And then he had to study on the attic. And I remember always like we would have dinner and we were going up to the attic to, to work. I remember the sick because I remember my father used to go like this a lot. And I never understood why, but like, I could imagine why. <laughs> um, so, about that, the landlady, the people who owned that house was living downstairs, was kind of crazy. Um, I think the man abused the wife, and we used to hear him fighting. Um, so, I was there with my brother, and my mother had gone back to the basement to the laundry. And I was with my brother being mean. Older friends, like those so I was like, and the landlady came and started knocking on the door and saying, Open up, open up. And I didn't want to open the door because I was basically the one in, in the house. And so she started screaming, If you don't open the door, I'm going to call the FBI, which was ridiculous because already, you know, this was all with knowledge. But, but for us, that, that was the moment that I was. But, um, remember when uh, they came home from the hearing? So we didn't go, and my parents didn't take some years. They came back, and um, they were, you know, like my mother's told, so, you know, dad's the hero today, and like, who's going to be the hero tomorrow? And so it was like that, that was the mostly what we looked up. Um, however, um, weren't shielded from a lot of hate, which they did keep from us. So, for example, well, and I do remember getting phone calls. The phone would ring, and my mother was just like hanging up, or she would curse, or like, you know, I could tell it wasn't a pleasant thing. But um, here's one thing I mean, said get out of this area, you're taking traitorous you we call you the son of a male dog and a female dog would be an understatement. You are through with your bullshit. Adolf the third. So that was a uh, male courthouse. Of course, no, no return to <laughs> uh, yeah. And then this letter came. This is May 8, 1964. This was also mailed to the house. Dear Josephine, that's my letter. How does it feel to be married to a comic? I see you work for a questionable character at the art gallery, too. So I'm with an artist, and she had a part time job teaching children's art classes at the um, Albany Art Gallery, which is a very nice museum. So, you know, Josephine, the communists have had some success in their field of art up to now. Thanks to help from you. We are not so stupid as you think. The goofy modern art is displayed at the gallery is strictly kind of stuff. There are those who are not up to this new world of communism that is ruining the cultural aspects of art and also reducing the feminine standing of women with that stupid statue of the art, which won't be there one of these days. I don't know what it is. Um, I'm doing my best to convince some students that your husband teaches to fix him good. I'm a good convincer. Kennedy was killed by a paid communist, don't forget. So just like, oh, this is a kind of male. And then this was also mailed to the house. Constance, America's newspaper against communism. Um, here are some of your friends. Why don't you quit UB or go to Russia? The UB states with the common rats. 
You're moving until you die, and so is your children. The time your children will die as they can. So this is the kind of um, stuff that, that they got, you know, um, which years later, it's funny. We get that it's, it's not fun because you know you. So then, um, so then my father had to look for work, and so I just put up three of the the letters that inquiries made for jobs, and there's a stack like this of all the places that he applied to for jobs. And the only one college in the whole United States was hired from after this, and that was Wayne State University in Detroit. So that's why I kind of said I was given refuge <laughs> by Detroit. And that's right. But, um, um, but here's an example. So here's some of his interviews. The one that actually does mention QAP being the reason that they weren't wouldn't hire him was from Ithaca College. So if you look at November second, nineteen sixty-four. So July seventh, nineteen sixty-four. Dear Mr. Sporn, thank you for your interest in Ithaca College. There's no opening for September, but your letter will be filed. Be notified if there's an opening for September 1965. In November or October 9th, our name is not been determined. As soon as they are, you'll be notified if there's an opening. It's a pleasure to hear that you'll complete your PhD in June of 65. Then in January of 65, we will have an opening in the English department. Someone with a good background in 19th century literature for the academic year of 65 66. If you're interested in this position, please forward your credentials as soon as possible, which he did. And then, what my father did as soon as um, he got a positive response, as he was asked to send his credentials, he said, I'm sending you your letter recognition and transcript of my graduate work will be sent back to you. One item on which I have not included in my video, although it is perhaps more valuable than the other, is at the moment, is that, and he talked about the Hubert coming to, to Buffalo or having called him. So that after he was scheduled to go to um, 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 up to, the, to be interviewed, and then he gets this letter uh, from the chair of the English department. Dear Mr. Sporn, this is my 25th. Dear Mr. Sporn, I'm sorry, someone in the past invite you that you are no longer being considered for the opening at Ithaca College. The dean has finally made it clear that your difficulty with the American Activities Committee has made him unwilling to become involved in a situation that might cause the college difficulty. He said that I do feel that he would stand firm if the problem arose with a faculty member already in the input of the college. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that incidentally, I have been reminded that the 1984 Act of Congress had outlawed the Communist Party, so that it is presently illegal to be a member of the party. The dean's position on this issue is that the college does not have obligations, oh, does have obligations to the law and should not go out of its way to hire a lawbreaker of any kind. And it goes on. I would like to know that I liked you very much as an individual, and in my opinion, your qualifications were excellent. Blah, blah. I must add, however, that professional considerations aside, you are a damn fool. You're a fool if you're still a communist. You're a fool if you are not a communist and won't tell the perspective of lawyer or so for idealistic reasons. So, anyway. And then, so my father wrote back. <laughs> But that's that, um, all the uh, uh, exchanges with universities. That's the one that I actually they stated, you know, the reason. But, um, yeah. Yeah, we wanted to be right. So, I think it's so Let's see if anything else I can say. 
One sister, and she was not she was a liberal, you know, a nice liberal. She wasn't radical at all. Um, she lived in suburban Maryland, you know, very um, <laughs> suburban life. Is that what you're yeah. uh, uh, Like Silver Spring, and you know, there, um, uh, her husband was an economist for the government, and um, they. They stood by her. They didn't have money. Like my mother worked part time at an art museum. My father was fired. Um, we, you know, we get, um, um, I, I think that was one time my mother said they had to go get some food, and it was like really humiliating. And, but you know, my and my uncle, who was probably less. I mean, I remember my uncle and my father having huge arguments around the dining room table about everything from Palestine to war to Muslim, who my uncle would call Mayo. And you know, just like they were not, they did not see eye to eye politically, but but for family, they they, they would they, they never um, um, push aside. And my Uncle for the government would have been probably in a very risky situation. So that that was a mix. Yes. So this I actually had started a project on a uh, lawyer on Ira Dolphin mm -hmm. and I shot a lot of footage for it and then he passed away before I could really um, do more. Uh, but I had before my father passed I interviewed him about this. I have a lot of material and it's something that um, if not a film, I was talking to other archivists who do work around um, immigration and and there is some kind of um, that makes artists and um, uh, really small um, segments of interviews that relate to certain key stories. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I was just curious what I'm like, how's he going get out of the year? Oh, he went to Wayne State University and he taught English. And it was hard for their years. Did that when they, you know, when they hired him, they they were like intrigued by it. I about Detroit. My parents are they're have no passports. They're not in Detroit anymore, but um, I'm back spending a lot of time in Detroit. And I, um, a couple of years, I was thinking about like who made those hiring decisions? Because I mean, I've been a job where you're on hiring committees. You have to, you know, you make decisions about who to hire. So I was like, who were the people who sat there? Who was the dean who wasn't assigned like this one? So I went to the um, English department and asked, I to inquire, but there aren't, um, evidently they don't have uh, the uh, hiring records. But I was definitely interested. Yeah. I did find out though my brother was in that the president of Wayne State at the time did have a um, reputation for being um, like I think he was against the Vietnam War so perhaps yeah. all of the media account he was just kind of interested in the comedy like, invited to meetings and stuff. Like do you know what like actual like means down like? Were they like like was the, what was the yeah, actual yeah. meeting like? 
But that's cool. Um, they me to the house, so it was like, I've been an activist as well, so I mean, it was like me, you, <laughs> you, you, you sit in a room with people and talk about, and, and I mean, I was eight, I, I couldn't tell you what they talked about, but it was people sitting in the living room having a conversation, and um, they would talk about what unions they had gone to, they had discussed, um, I'm sure they were intellectual too, so they were discussing Marxism. They were I mean, I remember what we had to be there, I was like, oh. what, maybe eight? And I'm, I'm just, no. I can't really it wasn't like people sitting in our living room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but some of the people uh, were, were very, very good friends. Of, of, like, really very close to my friends that were like extended family. Um, so that one of the other witnesses, actually two of the witnesses, to the couple at the same time. Um, you know, almost more like an aunt and uncle to me than than like. Did anyone go to jail? Not that. No. People did go to jail. Yeah, but not this. Well, if, so, so if you could be held in contempt, to put you in jail. Exactly. Pushed and pushed that just before they made a call. Um, uh, uh, for contempt of court, they would then claim the fifth. They had already done. I'm surprised that they, that they didn't just chuck uh, people off to prison because of that. Mm -hmm. it was your father in fear that uh, he would be put in prison? He, he did when I did this interview with him that it was intimidating because they have this, um, it's like how you see it on TV, he goes, that this is your double over there, over there. It's very intimidating. But I think when the, they, were, they prepared, they did this, um, um, in a reckless way. They, they, and this this lawyer, Ira Dolliman, had a way of practicing with his clients where he used um, in his cards. And so, like, all this stuff about, he it, it to come and tell him and mm -hmm. people were against his rights as you're sitting here legally. They, they reached out, what, what is it that we can bring up in, this, in, in our statements that the um, uh, the the effect points and how can we say that they were prepared they were prepared and, uh, they weren't trying to go to jail so they like I said maybe they didn't I guess you never know what's gonna happen so it was a possibility you know um, yeah. I'm sorry, Miss while I was trying to read all these things mm -hmm. um, but what was the final result of the the final, results be the, final result, because were, the final result was at the University of Buffalo, um, and it's also another, um, um, the, like an uncle to me, he was a, a, grad, also a graduate student doing research, he lost his fellowship as well. Okay. Um, I don't, the other people, I don't know yeah. what, their, what are their employment yeah. um, situation or, um, I think one of them was a optometrist. I can't remember. I don't know. But the result was that there were there were um, negative results in terms of our livelihood and yeah. their ability to work. Uh, I mean, uh, the one who was like, oh, he was able to come here to Columbia University and do good research, and he finished his doctorate, and he, he spent a career teaching at University of Connecticut. My father. Got a job at um, at Wayne State, um, but and it also 
will say there was one other college that offered a job, which was called the University of Victoria, which is on Vancouver Island. It's a little island north of um, Seattle. And um, but my parents didn't want to go to Canada because they didn't want to be brought out of the country. So, um, we did go there for summer. We went there for summer. It was, it was great. And at the time, I was like, why did you take this job? It was like a beautiful place. Um, so that, that was really awesome in terms of the personal um, impact on, on, on employment and, and yeah. family, but the impact on UAC was that they went back to Buffalo and they didn't hold any other satellite hearings again. Mm -hmm. And then in 1967, another round, no, 1966, they called people um, and um, people stood up and said, Yes, we are communists. They also had um, um, like negative results from on there. And then by 19, 1971, they changed the name to the House Internal Securities Committee. They weren't holding hearings. Mm -hmm. And then defunded in 1975. So the impact was that. It was a dent in yeah. what, what they could do. But like I said, in other uh, the government has tried to um, limit dissent, which is what it's oh, yeah. really about. Um, the fire fathers of later years was in a position to find it. It was about it in the education setting. They could have played the like, I like, guess a professor who, who like, formerly was a communist on major lectures. Like, he never saw me in a communist. So, did he openly discuss with yeah, the students? Um, he, he was, um, he was um, continued to be active at Wayne State. I remember by the time he was destroyed, um, and someone was in full swing. And I remember. I was in junior high, and so we were all getting, you know, political. And, and um, he spoke at a rally at the school. So he was great. His style was not to, um, um, like, impose his, his ideas. And, um, he would be honest and open. And and it would it would be reflected in his uh, teaching as well. Not sometimes I think people um, oversimplify. Uh, people have a social justice or a left wing or radical ideas, and I mean, and that's what UAC was the big thing was. Oh, a communist is teaching our, our children, our you know college students, but it's the danger. Um, but. When people have deep um, beliefs, it not just it doesn't come out just in a lecture. But for example, my father um, liked photography, and um, okay, here he, he was teaching um, Nate's son. I don't know if you can book right? But at the time, was not considered. When I was in high school, um, when I first got to high school, I book was um, banned. It was more, and then by the time I was in the last grade, he was able to read it. But so my father was teaching that book, and he um, got those photographs of all like the places mentioned in the book, and then brought that and incorporated that into his, into his, um, in his course. So I was that's a way of um, when there are communist characters in that complimentary characters in that book, but, but you know, in that way of engaging yeah. ideas. I went to Vancouver. Went to Vancouver as a child. It's nice and nice in uh, Buffalo. Yeah, that's. When I moved to Detroit, I was unhappy because, you know, who wants to move from the ground? Yeah, yeah. But someone said, well, <laughs> so these people were just telling you that like, because your parents and everything, like they were, they were coming from a place like just thinking that like they were the, they were just so scared of the American way of life, being here 
attack, and that's why it led them to really send hate stuff. Like, you know, what we can get thought of, like, where they're coming from, what, what was in the mind right now. Um, some of them may have been so um, influenced by the kind of anti-communist idea that we realized were in our culture at that time, there were uh, one, like, one was answer the what kind of characters on TV. Um, there, were, there was something called Red Channels. There were movies that were, um, I married a person. There was, the culture was, uh, and um, also, the anti-Semitism of um, that they were Jews was included in that. So, you know, whatever people may have been um, filled with that type of hate, maybe some of it was written by um, um, so again, the fear factor. Like the kind of people who go to Trump rallies and can say the things they say, and you know, who would, who would, who would. Uh, um, do you find that um, you have a lot of material from that era with uh, what happened with your father? Do you find that the fact that there was so much research and your parents were preserving that, and your father was so insistent on a nature that's right, that it shaped you as a documentary filmmaker through your creative process? For um, I love going into archives. That's one of the things that, that uh, we had begin doing in documentary work. But, um, I was a teacher for many years at, uh, and teaching for the Bronx at our high school and I teaching history. And I always loved all the history. I loved listening to people's stories and learning history in that way, like hearing people's experiences and participation of that. And um, and I always liked having students take the resources and and so I would say I would say yes, you know, the fact that I you know I'm one of the guys at my house. My brother has somebody. He's a physician. He's, he's not he's interested in this. Is me. Well, he's interested, but it's got to get in there. Do you follow the hero? Yeah. I do. Yeah. And I assume mother as well. Yeah. I mean, my mother, my mother was, um, she was more artist and she was, um, she she was involved in the movement for a bit, but she also didn't have, um, she had motivation for it. And she, was, uh, and she, she told the story at the time they were in Buffalo, there were a lot of um, people who were on the ground. Like I said, the Communist Party was a made of people in 1954. And people to go to jail. There was a Smith Act. You can look this up. Um, uh, people went to jail. People were deported. Someone named Claudia Jones was a, 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 a British Western background coming to a to England. Who the same lawyer who and my father, her lawyer. Um, so. He went underground, and um, my mother said that she she was fighting with my brother. It was raining, and she was supposed to meet someone. And she had the way she was supposed to meet this person was she had a paper under her arm, um, and um, and people had different names. So whoever it was, George, uh, was supposed to meet her. Never somehow never arrived. She got pneumonia, and she said she was have time for this, but <laughs> but she always she would design buttons, political buttons, and when she, when my father was called for you, she was um, you know defending it, and, and uh, yeah, so she was. Who paid for what? 
Um, he charged very little, and actually, part of when I was researching, I looked at his his papers. Um, he's actually also like I said so. His his papers, um, some of them are at archives, which is at NYU, and they have a whole collection of uh, um, left wing and. Um, um, so related to your topic about surveillance of radicals, if you want to get it. Um, so I was there looking through, going through, and I see this letter in my mother's handwriting to him, and it says, Dear Ira, here's another $25. Um, you know, the kids are fine. So I think they were paying him for a number of years. But, I was your your um. I, 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 I,